All right, where am I? My next question. This is kind of a long one, so I'm going to read it from a different uh, platform here. Okay, it says, I have a question. Uh, I work with a devout Catholic who rejects the Bible as the foundation of our faith. He states that since there are so many variations, its accuracy cannot be trusted. He further states that believing in Jesus and trusting in him <coughs> is enough and that we don't need to be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven because it is a twisting or incorrect rendering that has it written that way. Please help. I do. How do I answer him as a Bible being the foundation of our faith as I firmly believe it is? I personally use the New King James Version. I've given him the scripture in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 and John 3, 1 through 21, but he rejects these and insists only Christ's words can be trusted, not Acts, etc. Please provide guidance. So for this question right here, he says he's a devout Catholic. Mm -hmm. Devout Catholics don't Right. Yeah. Reject the, the Bible. The Bible. Yeah. No, they don't. So tell us what maybe a false premise here. Yeah. When you know when you're when you're looking at the the issue of uh, the reliability of the Bible, the guy obviously doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, when when you're talking about uh, the New Testament, the New Testament has so much document evidence that backs it up. Uh, it it just blows away anything that you any other ancient document that you have. And so his position that the New Testament is unreliable because there's been so many changes and there's not enough evidence for it and, and that kind of thing is just, uh, you know, it's a statement that comes from complete ignorance. If you get rid of the New Testament, you have to get rid of every ancient document that you have before the printing press. It's, it's uh, again, it's just r ridiculous. You know, when you're, when you're talking about... Uh, things like uh, uh, Josephus, the works of Josephus, or when you're talking about the, the works of uh, any Roman uh, uh, philosopher, uh, when you're talking about uh, Plato, when you're talking about Socrates, you know, same thing, but uh, not same guys. But uh, when, you're, when you're talking about um, Greek philosophers, when you're talking about Roman histories, they don't even come close to the number of manuscripts that we have for the New Testament. So when you're, when you're talking about the New Testament itself, you're talking about um, well over 5,000 manuscripts. It's getting up closer to 6,000 manuscripts in Greek, in the original language. And then when you start looking at uh, other languages, because the New Testament was translated quickly into uh, Syriac, for example, that's called the Peshitta, um, or, uh, and uh, translated into Old Latin, and then translated later on into New Latin. Same thing with uh, Syriac, Old Syriac and New Syriac, and um, we have, when, when you get all done with it, you have over 24,000 manuscripts. Ancient manuscripts means handwritten copies of the New Testament. And there are differences, but the differences don't have to do with anything doctrinal. And you can easily go through, well, I, let me not use that term. You can go through and you can tell uh, when a difference is, is at issue or not. And... Um, Basically, when you're looking at the at the text of the New Testament, the percentages that scholars give on this is that 99, well over 99% of the New Testament, we know exactly what it said without question, without question. And it, of the of the one percent, and it's actually less than one percent, but of the one percent that's left, uh, almost all the time. It has nothing to do with anything except for spelling and, or word order. Um, sometimes words will be changed, but the words don't even affect the meaning of the of the passage. And one of the things, the things that's cool about uh, the Bible is that the Bible doesn't just you don't you don't just have one passage in the Bible on love. You don't have one passage in the Bible on the Holy Spirit. You don't have one passage in the Bible on the resurrection of Christ. You don't have one passage. You have multiple passages. And so uh, a guy named Chuck Missler one time was, was talking about the, the fact that the, the Bible is kind of like a hologram. And you can clip out major portions of the Bible and um, you don't lose all the information. You, you, you lose some clarity, but all the information as far as, uh, as, far as the doctrinal issues is all still there. Yeah. And so uh, it doesn't matter what Bible I pick up. I can... I, I can uh, show you uh, that Jesus is God, that Jesus uh, lived a sinless life, that he went to the cross, that he died for our sins, that he rose again from the dead, 
uh, and any doctrine that you want to talk about that the New Testament speaks about, um, it doesn't matter which Bible that you use. There are some Bibles that are corruption, so the New World Translation is an, is an obvious uh, corruption by the Jehovah's Witnesses, and everybody knows this. But otherwise, you know, it's, it's like the New Testament is the most well-attested document, ancient document, that we have. And, and so this guy saying that you can't trust the New Testament uh, means that you have to throw out all of ancient history. No scholar does that. Nobody does that. And so this guy, the guy on the, in the first place doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, isn't it kind of a self-refuting statement when he says that he throws out Scripture but then listens to the words of Jesus, which yeah. are Scripture? So if you're looking right. at textual criticism, if he's going to throw that out, then why does he uh, rely on the words of Jesus? Because it's in the same book. Right. Well, one of the, one of the problems with that, and that was, that was the next thing that I was going to point out, he, he specific, uh, you know, in the question, the book of Acts is specifically mentioned. Well, Luke wrote the book of Acts. Right. Luke also wrote the book of Luke. Mm -hmm. And so Luke is writing down the words of Jesus. And so if you can't trust Luke and Acts, why do you think that you would be able to trust Luke and Luke? And that's, again, that's just an argument that comes from ignorance. He doesn't, and I don't mean ignorance in a, in a, in a mean way. I mean ignorance in the sense that the, the guy just does not know what the issues are. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And, and so uh, there, you know, there is no Christianity without the message of Jesus. And the message of Jesus was given by Jesus to the apostles. And um, he told them that they were going to be witnesses of what he taught, um, witnesses of the things that he said. And um, again, when you talk about the New Testament, you don't have one word in the New Testament that was written by Jesus himself. It doesn't, it doesn't it, that's, that's not what he did. What he did was he came and he preached and he taught these guys and he made them his witnesses. And there's a reason for that. And the reason has to do with idolatry. Can you imagine if we actually had words that Jesus penned down, you know, what people would be doing with that? This guy doesn't even have that and he's already doing it. And again, he doesn't, he doesn't understand that Matthew was a witness to Jesus, wrote down Jesus' words. Mark was a witness to, uh, frankly, Peter and wrote down what Peter said that Jesus said. Luke was a witness. He went, uh, he went to uh, different people who knew Jesus and wrote down what they said that Jesus said. And same, John was a, was a witness himself, and he wrote down the things that Jesus said. You don't, have the, you don't have the words of Jesus in the handwriting of Jesus in the New Testament. And so that, that whole argument is self-refuting on the, you know, on the face of it. Um, when you, uh, not only do we have manuscripts, and the manuscripts that I'm talking about are, you have Greek manuscripts, over 5,000, almost 6,000 now, uh, uh, Greek manuscripts in the original language, and then you have, um, when you add that with the rest of the manuscripts, you have more than 24,000 manuscripts of the New Testament, and um, we, that, that is not the only evidence that we have. Uh, there are these pastors that were around in the first and the second and the third and the fourth century um, who quoted extensively from the New Testament, from the whole Bible. But they quoted extensively from the New Testament. And these guys wrote so many quotes from the New Testament that if you got rid of every manuscript of the New Testament in the world, every Bible in the world, you could get the whole Bible, or the whole New Testament specifically, out of their writings. And so, again, when you're, when you're looking at these things that these guys are saying, you know, they're, they're quoting from the Beatitudes, for example, and, and it says exactly what your Bible says, blessed are the poor in spirit, you know, for uh, the, theirs is the kingdom of heaven, and so on. And so um, we, we know that the New Testament says what it says, and there's no reason to go after that. Um, what was the other thing that they were talking about? Uh, that believing in Jesus and trusting in him is enough and that we don't need to be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, you know, the guy says that he believes in the words of Jesus, um, and Jesus is the one who came up with the term born again. And so, again, he's not being consistent. This is, this is where Jesus speaks about being born again. Um, he says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot, or excuse me, uh, this is in John 3. Uh, Jesus said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so, there, you know, there's, there, there's no consistency 
uh, to what the guy is saying. And um, I am not a Greek scholar, but I can read Greek. And I can tell you that that's exactly what it says in Greek. And there's, there's, not a, there's not a translation that translates that different. It means born again. And you can see that from Nicodemus's answer. Um, I'm going to give you the whole passage. In verse 2, it says, this guy Nicodemus, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And so you can tell by the context that the words that Jesus is using are, are the words, you have to be born again. And then he goes through and he explains what that means. But he uses the term. And so to, to say that you believe in the words of Jesus and then you come along and, and, and say that, well, that's been uh, mistranslated is just nonsense. You can see from the context it's not mistranslated. Nicodemus literally thought Jesus was telling him to climb back into his mother's womb. And so to be born again. And Jesus disabuses him of that thought and tells him that he needs to be born of the Spirit. So, so I mean, you talked about textual criticism. There's like a million, not a million, but um, a lot of different other things when you're talking about archaeology, when you're talking about mm -hmm. um, prophecy and stuff like that. I mean, you're talking about um, love being a principle throughout the Bible that you don't just need one verse. Right. And one of my first like aha moments that the Bible is the word of God is when you go to the Abraham offering up his son yeah. where it's the first time the word love is mentioned and right. it's in the context of a father giving up his son and you go through as there a sacrifice. as yeah. a sacrifice right? and yeah. then you go through there and it's like the two thieves and all this stuff represents and then you look at where it was mm -hmm. and it's at Golgotha uh -huh. where Jesus was offered up Yeah. however many 2,000 years later and right. you put that together and it's like Unbelievable. Right. There is no way that some ancient rabbi pinned <laughs> this down. Uh -huh. And our central event in history, you know, BC, yeah. uh, is a concoction. Right. You know, right. I mean, it's, you can prove that the Bible was written outside of time because of a prophecy. Right. So when you have guys like this, and I, I, I remember like there's Episcopalian dude that, you know, he would have an issue with whatever um, in the Bible, and then you would ask him about it, and he goes, well, that's a book of John, but John didn't really write John, and he, and he plays all these games. So when you have someone that does that, what's your approach in trying to actually have a conversation, or do you even have one when they're just well, you know, disregarding it's, Scripture? This is, it's like this. When, when people uh, take passages of Scripture and, and say that, well, that's, that's not really something, because they'll do that with Matthew too. Um, and so what I do is I go, so you don't believe that Jesus actually... Uh, you know, when, when Matthew does the Sermon on the Mount, you don't believe that that actually came from Jesus. And um, I've had guys say, well, no, I don't. And I go, have you ever read it? And so if Jesus didn't come up with that, then who did? And whoever did, I'll follow him. How about that? Right. You know, and, 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 and so again, it's just self-defeating because you have these things that are, that are taught in Scripture that we've been told by these guys came from Christ himself, and when you look at the things that he said, th this is not stuff that just comes from normal people. Yeah. You know, when, when you look at every world religion that's, that's on this planet, when they start talking about Jesus, they treat him with respect, they always want him on their side, and there's a reason for that, because the words that you have penned down in the New Testament are just far and away above anything that anybody's ever come up with. And so you have Gandhi quoting Jesus. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you go through and you, you look at anybody that is talking about religion on, one, on any level, and they all want, again, Jesus to be on their side. And there's a reason for that. And it's because it came from Jesus. It didn't come from Peter. It didn't come from Paul. It didn't come from John. It didn't come from, you know, some sheep herder in the Middle East someplace. It, it, it came from the Son of God. You can tell by going through and reading it. And so, you know, a lot of times the argument is self-defeating. Uh, again, you know, when, when I'm talking to people, it's like, 
you know, I, uh, literally I, I was having a, a conversation with a kid who had taken a philosophy class and taken a world religions class and actually believed what the professors were saying. And I just took him through the Sermon on the Mount and, and, and you know, just showed him the quality there and, and just went, seriously, you think that, you know, that, that you want to take this and you want to put it in the mouth of somebody else besides Christ? Do you really want to? Is that really what your argument's going to be? And the guy's just flabbergasted and doesn't know what to say. And obviously that was a, you know, that was a good half hour to 45 minute conversation. Yeah. But backed him down real, you know, really easily just by um, quoting the words of the Lord. And, and so, again, you were talking about prophecy. Uh, the things that happened in Jesus's life are found in Isaiah 53 very clearly. Mm -hmm. You know, just talking about uh, his ministry. You can, you can, uh, the place where he was going to min uh, be ministering is found in Isaiah chapter 9. And it, uh, it talks about the whole area of Galilee and the fact that the, a light has come. And that's the passage where it talks about uh, for unto us a, a child is born, for unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and he'll, sh he'll be called a uh, wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Well, this is stuff that's in the Old Testament. And, you know, it's, it's prophesied about the coming of Christ. Coming of Christ uh, to the city of Jerusalem was prophesied to the day in the book of Daniel. And so, you know, uh, again, whenever, whenever I'm having a conversation with guys like this, um, uh, you know, obviously, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a pastor. I've been a Christian for a long time. And I really like apologetics. But whenever I'm having a conversation with people like this, these are the th kind of things that I pull out and, and I start talking to them about. There is a book uh, called Science Speaks. It's written back in the 60s. And it's ac actually a statistical analysis of the prophecies of the coming of Christ. And what uh, Peter Stoner did was he took a bunch of graduate students and uh, went through and picked eight prophecies about the coming of Jesus the first time. And... Uh, went through and gave reasonable um, odds for those things happening. So, for example, uh, Jesus being born in Bethlehem. And the way that you give odds for Jesus being born in Bethlehem is you take uh, the number of people who uh, are, are alive during that time and you take the number of people uh, that you think were alive and living in, in Bethlehem at that time. You do the math, you do the division and that kind of stuff. And so he would get a number. You have a one in so many chance of this, of this stuff happening. And he would get a number. And then a lot of times what they would do is just to make sure they would double it. You know? And so if it was uh, a one in 150,000 chance, then they go, well, let's make it one in 300,000. You know, just to do, the, do this, or excuse me, uh, they, they would half it. So if it was one in 300,000, they would half it to one chance in 150,000. And so they would make it a, a better odd for those things to happen. And still, with doing all of that, they went through and they talked about uh, where Jesus was born, um, how Jesus was going to die, uh, uh, Jesus coming into Jerusalem on a donkey, and I could go through and list you um, all eight of the prophecies. I memorized them on purpose so that, so that I could do this with people. And then he went and he came up with a number. And that number is the equivalent of taking the whole state of Texas, filling it up with silver dollars, two feet deep, and lots of people know this illustration, stirring them up, putting a blindfold on a guy, having him walk through the whole state of Texas so that each coin, you mark a coin, um, and throw it in there, stir it up, have a guy walk through so he has an equal chance of picking uh, every single coin and having him reach down and first time picking the coin. Mm -hmm. That's the chance for eight prophecies. And when you take and do 16 prophecies, that's taking the sun, filling the sun with silver dollars and having the guy go through. And, and what, what happens is there's an extrapolation on, on this stuff. There, it, it gets, it's an exponential type of situation when you start adding the, the prophecies up. There are over 400 prophecies that Jesus fulfilled out of the Old Testament. Verifiable prophecies that Jesus for, fulfilled out of the Old Testament. And just the, the numbers against that are just ridiculous for those things to happen by chance. And, and the obvious, obvious answer is they didn't happen by chance. And so, 
again, um, when uh, there, there are some uh, things that you probably need to do to just educate yourself so that you can talk with a guy like this. And uh, one, of the, one of the books that you could get is Evidence That Demands a Verdict. It's by Josh McDowell. Uh, every every Christian who is going to, to well, every Christian should just have this because everybody needs to be witnessing to people. But you need to have it in your library and go through and read it. And um, he's updated it, and so that's cool because when I first got it, it was like reading a you know reading a text. Well, it's still like reading a textbook, but a lot of it was in yeah. The version two is awesome. Yeah. He it's, came to uh, Bethel when I first got saved, so I got to meet him and bought that book then. About oh, that's cool. 12, 14 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Totally worth having, and he'll go through and, and talk about each one of these issues. Anything that this guy can bring up um, uh, has already been answered and answered thoroughly, and uh, McDowell does a really good job of, yeah. of uh, taking care of that in his book. So, All right, well. Evidence that demands a verdict. Josh McDowell. So I'm going to ask about this just because it kind of pertains to what we're talking about. One of the things that people do when you're talking about, you know, actually textual criticism is, uh, archaeology. Uh -huh. Did you see that uh, it looks like they're saying they found the town of Ziklag over in Israel by some of the stuff they No, I didn't. I didn't see that. Yeah, they found so, Ziklag. Wow. Yeah, so it's an article and they, you know, they have the article gives various information on why they think it is because of the tri uh, tribal things that they're finding there and stuff like that. But it's so cool because when you take the Bible and, and there's just another thing that we haven't even discussed about actually the Bible. When you take the Bible, you can you literally use it as a map. Right, yeah. And thousands of years later, we're digging stuff up, and guess what? It yeah. matches what that book right. says. Yeah, way cool. Yeah, when you're when you're talking about the discoveries of, of a lot of the uh, archaeological sites in Israel, um, there there are these phases that archaeologists go through. And so, one of the phases that the archaeologists went through was that you know that they decided that they were going to trust the Bible as to whether or not um, these cities existed. And uh, then they'll go through a phase where they're where they're like, well, the Bible's not something that's factually accurate, and so we're not going to pay any attention to the Bible. But then it, it pendulum swings back the other direction, and that's been going on uh, lately. Uh, back in the early 1900s, uh, there was a guy named Garstang and actually some other archaeologists that just literally used the Old Testament to find cities. And uh, you have to understand that the, these cities have been buried for a very long time. A lot of times they're under, underneath hills, with, which are called tells, and you don't know where they're at. And, yeah. It's and amazing what, how fast that happens. Because yeah. Hanford, I work out at Hanford, which is where they, you know, 1940s bomb and stuff. But you'll go out in the desert, and you can't see anything. And then you'll be walking around, and there's like these ruins of a whole city factory there and roads and railroad tracks that you'll never see. Yeah. Well, that was in the 1940s, and it's already gone. Right, yeah. And so when, you, when, when these guys go to the Bible, they're able to find the cities that the Bible talks about. And, and so that's, uh, again, evidence of the historicity of Scripture. Uh, one of the things that you need to understand, uh, again, about attacks on the Bible <clears throat> is that this has been going on for a very long time. And so there was a whole empire called the Hittite Empire that during the 1800s, uh, you, can, you can see commentaries by liberal theologians, people who don't actually believe the Bible, where they were mocking the Old Testament and saying it couldn't be factually accurate because it talks about these this group of people, the Hittites, and there is no evidence for these guys, and you know it's it's an argument from silence, no evidence of these guys, and so therefore the Bible's inaccurate, and you know then they start digging up evidence of the Hittites and they found out that these guys had an empire that stretched from Turkey all the way down to Egypt, and in fact that they were a group of people that had major conflicts with Egypt and you know. And all this stuff. And these guys who wrote these things down and made these statements look like complete idiots, usually within 50 years of their statement. And you, you have the same kind of stuff going on. Uh, uh, there's uh, archaeological digs that are, that are going on in Israel that are just amazing. There's uh, the city of David, for example, uh, that the Bible talks about is found exactly in exactly the place um, in the area of Jerusalem where the city of David is said to have been. Yeah, so if, cool. They found David's palace. For example, and so uh, you have you have all these things going on. They have they have what are called uh, bula, which are uh, they're seals uh, with names on them, and uh, they're they're you know like when we talk about signet rings and that kind of stuff. We have we have these things that have the names of guys in the Bible on them, uh, government officials from the time of Isaiah, their names on these things. 
and they found him in the in the, the the palace that was originally David's and became the palace of the kings after him. So awesome. Yeah, that's cool. All right, we got a bunch of guys there patiently waiting on here. What, okay, one more thing. What's so cool is that you mentioned, I mean, we're talking about archaeology and how there's a 50 year thing and then it, the pendulum swings. When I first got saved, there's this huge battle in science with evolution, and the same thing happened. Well, now the more scientific we have, the further we can see inside of a cell, the more we realize that the Bible is more accurate than mm -hmm. what their evolutionary theory had first anticipated on the simple cell theory. So right, yeah. it just continues on and on and on in whatever direction you go with this.